All right. To reintroduce myself, or first I introduce myself. My name is Brian Morton. I'm a graduate assistant and student here at UK with the Health and Wellness Department. And today we'll be talking about caffeine, how to approach it mindfully and use it well in your daily uh, routine. So today's breakdown, this is all we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to discuss what is caffeine, um, where does it come from, what does it do, and in regards to what it does, how does developing a tolerance affect that? So if you're one of those people that drinks coffee on a daily basis, you've probably developed some kind of tolerance to its effects versus somebody who really drinks it at all. Um, we'll talk about how to make it healthier and ways to kind of improve the use of it in your day is fine, um, kind of reduce the number of excess calories that kind of go along with it. And uh, we'll talk about uh, how much is safe to take, take or drink um, and as well as where else it comes from other than coffee. So to start, what is caffeine? Caffeine is a natural stimulant that is found in certain plants. Um, these plants are many in variety, up to 60 have been known uh, to contain caffeine. Our primary ones that we look at though are the, coca, or the cola nut, the coffee bean, and the cocoa bean. These are three kind of primary or most common places that we'll find it in our diets. Uh, it's used in a variety of medicines, uh, namely anisin, excedrin, and migraine, so headache relief. Um, and it has also been used in tandem with other headache medicines such as Advil or Aleve um, to kind of help boost those effects. Um, as far as food and drinks, it's found in uh, coffees, teas, colas, energy drinks, um, as well as chocolate. Um, those would be our main five. And as far as weight management products, it is also used as a primary ingredient in many. Um, and we will dive into that in a little bit. So how does it work? In order to kind of understand why we're taking it, we need to understand what it does. Um, so it inhibits the neurotransmitters that cause sleepiness. And that's where you get that awake feeling from. That's kind of what gets you started during your day. Um, it stimulates adrenaline production, uh, which is kind of that flight or flight response that you get. And um, with this, you're gonna see basically the same effects um, that you would get with uh, this natural adrenaline. So it's not necessarily the caffeine that is doing this, it's that re adrenaline response to the caffeine. And this is gonna be that increased heart rate, uh, increased blood flow, opening up airways, uh, minor increases in blood pressure, and uh, some relative muscle activation, which for those of us that were either new to caffeine at some point or don't hardly ever drink it, or too much, as some of us may know, that's where you get that really jittery, really jittery feeling where you kind of almost can't control your hand to an extent. Um, and lastly, we're going to talk about dopamine. That's where um, we get this happy feeling we get in the morning. We kind of move past that. No one talked to me until I have my coffee face. Um, and that's kind of also where the caffeine addiction um, trend starts to play uh, into effect. So as far as effects, we need to understand how tolerance will affect that because tolerance will cause different results in different people and cause caffeine to act in different ways for those of us that are used to it and those of us that are not. So these effects will vary from person to person. And in order to further understand this, um, we'll look at a comparison here in a minute. But the primary effects that we're going to be looking at today are going to be sleepiness, mental alertness, and anxiety and jitteriness. There are a number of other effects that go along with caffeine that have also to do with uh, some of the uh, responses we talked about earlier, but these three are gonna be our primary as far as what we're used to experiencing during the day and what's gonna be e most easily translated into uh, kind of our daily routines and what we're gonna take away from this today. So a study at University of Manchester looked at a uh, number of uh, two groups, those being those who hardly ever consume caffeine. They don't drink coffee in the morning. They don't really drink soda. If they do, it's just like one here and there, maybe at dinner or something, very low caffeine use. And the other group was sort of the rest of us. Those of us that have a cup or two or six of cups of coffee in the morning, um, drinks tea on a daily basis, uh, heavy cola or energy drink drinkers, 
Um, and they gave each group 250 milligrams of caffeine over the course of the morning, that being from about 10 a.m. to noon in uh, varying ranges. But the key thing was looking at the, how the users responded to caffeine and how they were, or how they were before they had the caffeine and how they were after the caffeine. So starting with those who really didn't drink the non-low users, before caffeine, they're kind of just their regular selves. They're asleep, they're awake, they're not sleepy or tired or anything. They're kind of at that level um, that they wanna be at. And as far as anxiety or jitteriness, that feeling we talked about earlier, get the shakes or you start to kind of overreact to certain things. Um, they're also at a normal state. I mean, they haven't been affected by anything yet. So as a result, their mental alertness is gonna be uh, kind of where it should be. It's gonna be how they normally feel on a daily basis. They're not uh, being affected by anything. But after the caffeine, their sleepiness will go down. So they're becoming more awake. They have more energy. They're feeling more active and they feel pretty good. But they get that anxiety jittering to this feeling that we talked about earlier. And this actually results in a leveled out mental alertness. So although they are more awake, they're less able to concentrate because of the down effects of caffeine. If we talk about the medium and high users, before caffeine, you're actually more sleepy than you would be compared to somebody who doesn't ever drink caffeine or rarely does. Um, and your anxiety and jitteriness is at a normal level as it should be. And as a result of these two, you're less alert in the morning compared to somebody that doesn't normally drink coffee. It doesn't take a study to really understand that. But um, after the caffeine, you've kind of returned to a normal state. You haven't gotten really an extra boost from the caffeine. The caffeine has kind of brought you back to your normal or what would be your normal state in the morning had you not been um, used to the effects of caffeine already. And because of your being used to it, your anxiety or jitteriness levels are gonna be normal. They're not gonna change because you're used to these effects already and your body's adapted to it. And as a result, your mental alertness is also um, back to where it should be. So you'll notice that those who don't drink it in the morning in comparison to those who do drink it after the effects are essentially the same as far as alertness in the morning and awareness. So start to dive into the fun stuff. Uh, we'll look at content here, um, differences between coffee and tea versus energy drinks, and how to make each of these things healthier and kind of hopefully debunk some myths about some of them today too. Um, so we'll look here. Our highest one of all is gonna be an espresso drink at 140 milligrams per two ounces. So these are all approximate um, serving sizes, as you would say, for each one of these drinks. Now I know eight ounces of coffee is very low for some of us, but um, for the sake of this, it's about one cup. So that's what we're comparing today. Um, and if you'll notice dark chocolate down here actually does contain about 12 milligrams of caffeine per one ounce in most bars of chocolate or more than one ounce. So um, it is estimated roughly 50, 45 to 50 milligrams per um, amount of dark chocolate. And um, the key thing with that is that uh, if you look at dark chocolate versus milk chocolate, dark chocolate will have more because it has a more potent natural cocoa bean in it. And uh, on most dark chocolate bars, it'll give you a concentration of dark chocolate or cocoa. In a sense, they'll read either 80%, 70%, some kind of percentage as to how much true cocoa, I guess you would say, is in the bar. And the higher that rating is, the more caffeine is gonna be present in that bar. So that is something to look out for. And we'll talk more about uh, these drinks here in a minute. So there is some content variability as far as drink to drink. Um, now with colas and energy drinks and um, these more controlled drinks, they are very regulated by the FDA and um, all of the uh, markets and branches that govern those products. So they have to be a very regulated amount of caffeine and they have to monitor that very carefully. Um, so that really doesn't vary as much as you would see in a coffee or tea where the effects can change relatively easily actually. So if we look at factors that affect caffeine content in coffee specifically, water temperature is gonna be one of those bigger factors. So if we look at cold brew versus hot coffee, 
when it comes out, it's essentially the same amount of caffeine per cup. Um, the downside or the other side of that story is that caffeine responds better to hot water. It absorbs better into hot water than it does cold water. So that's why that instant coffee and the coffees that you usually buy at uh, any kind of um, grocery chain or coffee market or uh, like Starbucks, for example, um, is going to be uh, served hot because it's easy. It's quick. Whereas your cold brew coffee uh, takes a little bit longer. If you increase the amount of time that it takes for, or the amount of exposure that the coffee bean or the grounds get to the water, then you're going to increase the amount of caffeine that's absorbed into that drink. And that's where cold brew makes up for its caffeine content. So even though it's absorbed slower, it's exposed to longer, and they actually use more grounds to brew cold coffee than they do hot coffee. So it kind of levels things out, and in the end, you get um, relatively the same caffeine content. The primary difference there being taste. And there are some differences as well as far as light versus dark roast coffee. Um, those differences are not uh, in particular significant. Um, it's very minute differences. The primary difference you're gonna get there is taste. So most of us, me included, are more than one cup of coffee in the morning drinkers, two or more. Um, and if we look back, that's roughly 300 milligrams of caffeine, which is uh, relatively a lot. But we're not gonna overdose on caffeine at any point. Um, it would take 200 milligrams per kilogram or 91 milligrams per pound, which for me would be about 103 cups of coffee or 15,422 milligrams of caffeine instantly. Because as soon as my body gets it, it's going to start to metabolize it and that would affect that. But so needless to say, we don't have to worry about that. But there are negative effects that do start to come with too much caffeine. And that amount is different for everybody because we all metabolize it and kind of process it differently at a different rates. So um, if we look at the half-life of caffeine, this is an average amount. It will be different for everybody. Um, it will be, it should be relatively close to this number, but so this is a good estimate. Um, the half-life is the amount of time it takes to reduce the concentration of any drug or substance in your body by half. So the half-life of caffeine is six hours. So for example, if I had one cup of coffee in the morning, or just under, and we'll say it was 100 milligrams of caffeine at eight o'clock in the morning, six hours later at two o'clock, there would be 50 milligrams left in my body. And then six hours later at 8 p.m., it would be down to 25, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're starting with this two cups of caffeine in the morning at, we'll say 300 like it was before, and by 2 p.m., you still have 150 milligrams left in your body. You may not need that two or three cup serving of coffee that you had in the morning to get back to where you were before. You may not need nearly as much. You may only take one cup or so to kind of get you back to where uh, you felt before and kind of back to a normal pace to get past that kind of 2 p.m. crash. So um, kind of take this into account and kind of play with the amount of coffee you have in the morning and maybe see if you can reduce it, reduce it a little bit uh, in the afternoon. So as far outside of content, there are plenty of ways to make coffee healthier. Give me a chance to turn the page here. So again, we talked about light versus dark roast coffee. Um, the only real difference here is taste and preference. Um, there are minute differences in caffeine, as we said before, but uh, that's kind of negligible at this point. Um, so outside of just the grounds and the water, what else is going into your coffee? So if you're going into Starbucks, for example, and you're getting that uh, cold serve frappuccino out of the fridge on the go, what else is going to be in that drink besides just your coffee and water? You're going to have milk, additives, probably some extra sugar in there that you don't want. Basically, excess calories that you really don't want to see in your drink. I know it does make it taste good, but there are uh, downsides to it. So if you do want to order that Frappuccino or that um, Venti Latte or whatever your favorite drink is from Starbucks, um, there are some ways to make it healthier. Um, for example, 
first one would be just to order a smaller size. Now, I know this would be less caffeine, but you could ask for, say, an extra shot of espresso to make up, make up for that. Um, you could also ask for non-fat or almond milk, and maybe you don't get the extra whip this time. Um, now, I wrote down some examples of some of their higher calorie drinks. Um, starting at the bottom going up, these are all grande size at 2% milk, so as they would normally be served. Cafe Mocha is at 190 calories, and that's just the bottom of the barrel. Caramel Macchiato goes up to 250. A Pumpkin Spice Latte goes up to 310. Caramel Brulee Latte goes to 360, and for seasonal preferences here, the Peppermint White Chocolate Mocha exceeds 450 calories. That's about a fourth of what a normal person needs in a day as far as calories, all in one drink in the morning or early afternoon for most of us. So there, it might be uh, beneficial here, probably would be beneficial here to try to reduce that uh, intake. So if we move from coffee to green tea here, um, this is uh, kind of one of the more uh, variable topics as far as uh, other benefits outside of the caffeine content um, and what else goes in it? Uh, all tea does come from the same plant. So if we look at differences between black tea, herbal tea, green tea, white tea, um, and a few other types, uh, they all do come from the same plant. And the differences here is how it's processed. So what spices they're putting into it, um, any other additives that they might be putting in it to make it taste a certain way, uh, is how you're going to get these different varieties of tea. And uh, as a result, these teas all contain polyphenols that come from the plant. Um, and these polyphenols are uh, very beneficial and have been linked to heart health, uh, improved vascularity, and uh, reduced decline in cognitive function um, in some of our older populations. Uh, and as far as hydration, both coffee and tea are major contributing factors to our normal hydration status throughout the day and the total amount of fluids that we're getting in a day. Um, so kind of control or taking that into account, um, not that it will replace your cup of water in the morning or uh, in the afternoon and not that you shouldn't drink other things, but it does contribute to uh, your hydration status. Um, iron intake is also um, one of the uh, kind of subjects that goes along with green tea specifically. Um, there is a slight downside with green tea being that it does slightly reduce iron intake. Um, so people who are kind of at the most risk for, excuse me, most risk for iron deficiency, um, those being either pregnant women or children, um, should probably stay away from green tea uh, as it is, and ideally coffee as well. Um, but the rest of us, uh, regular population men, um, healthy women, should kind of dabble in it as it is and uh, feel free to uh, partake on a regular basis. But cancer is the last kind of um, subject that goes along with green tea uh, heavily. So there have been studies in the past that have found a link between green tea and reduce cancer rates in things such as breast cancer, um, stomach cancer, and um, some varieties of skin cancer. And they have found that it can slow the spread of it, but there are no real definitive answers when it comes to this subject. There have been mixed results kind of across the board. Some studies have found a really good connection between green tea and reducing cancer and others have found next to or no correlation at all between uh, the two. So kind of take that with a grain of salt and um, really ask a professional about that one if you do have uh, further concerns with it. Energy drinks, our last one, and our least friendly. They do contain more than just caffeine as tea does and as coffee does. Um, they're very high in sugar and other additives, specifically those other additives, because we have our diet versions of these. And they actually have less caffeine than coffee and um, can relatively be on the same page as tea in some instances. 
So if we look over to the side here, serving sizes being about eight, we have nearly half of the amount of caffeine that you'll find in um, your cup of coffee. And for our other drinks, you need uh, twice the amount of energy drink to get that same amount of, or approximate same amount of caffeine that you're gonna find in a cup of coffee. Our cola, Coca-Cola and Mountain Dew down here don't have as much, but they are higher in sugar and other additives that go along with sodas. They're not necessarily drank for the caffeine, but it is um, a key substance that is found in them. So if we look at what else they add in it to kind of make up for this lack of caffeine, we find uh, taurine, guarana, and ginseng. So taurine is an amino acid that is naturally produced by the body and is actually artificially developed to be put into these drinks. So our body doesn't really need, it doesn't actually need any extra taurine and it's not going to benefit from the added effects that of it being put into these drinks and consumed so um, that one kind of gets nixed off the table guarana our next one is a more dense source of caffeine compared to the cola nut or coffee bean and um, is kind of used as a replacement substance for caffeine instead of using um, something with more flavor so it has been found to be um, slightly more effective than using a cola nut or coffee bean, likely because of the uh, increased potency, but it also has been linked to increases in headaches and um, other minor um, instances. Ginseng, our last one here, has been used for a long time throughout history as a med uh, medicinal herb and has been used to promote memory, um, but also is one of those that has been linked to cause headaches and is could be part of the reason that we do see um, people getting headaches that drink a lot of energy drinks or sodas or things like that. So um, then lastly, they're generally used to consume caffeine faster. So when you have an energy drink or you're buying one of these things, you can kind of take it on the go. You don't need to carry it around in a mug. You can't, you can do way more than just sit at your desk with it basically. And lastly, if you can't stay awake, it probably could be something more than caffeine. Um, if you look at kind of your uh, life as a whole, or your, at least your health profile, you'll uh, want to look at your sleep, your diet, and your exercise and kind of see how these are affecting your daily productivity. So making sure you're getting that proper night's sleep, that six to eight hours or some of us more, uh, eating a well-balanced diet, getting all of fruits and vegetables, um, adequate protein and good sources of fats, and lastly, getting proper exercise, um, getting in good aerobic conditioning, and doing strength training as well. So, we can help, luckily. Uh, you can meet with one of our specialists to, to go over a fitness consult and kind of see where you're at. You can meet with one of our wellness coaches, and you can consult with a registered dietitian to go over really any of these um, subjects that we discussed earlier. And you can find all of these down here at this website, which is also on your pamphlets, at uky.edu slash hr slash wellness. And that's about it. Do you guys have any questions? Is um, As far as decaffeinated coffee um, and decaffeinated drinks in general, what do they do to the drinks to get the caffeine out of it? And what kind of effects does that have uh, on consuming it? And what does it kind of... How does that affect us? Um, so I am not sure how they get the caffeine out. Um, as far as energy drinks and colas, um, we do have another source for these answers. Hi, everyone. So my name is Vanessa Oliver, and I'm one of the registered dietitians with Wellness. Thank you. And Sue, in response to your question, from what I understand, as far as the decaffeination process with coffee, for example, it's a water-based process that they use um, on the beans to um, take the caffeine out. Beyond that, I can't speak to exactly what the process is. Um, when, if it's an energy drink or a soda, then of course they won't be adding the caffeine to the beverage. Now, I believe that the second part of your question was what the decaffeinated beverage does to your body. Was that correct? Is it harmful? Um, no. So once you have a decaffeinated beverage, of course, taking into account any sort of added sugars, 
or acids that may be in a soda, for example, or perhaps an artificial sweetener that might be in a soda, energy drink, or tea. Um, those might have effects, but a decaffeinated beverage in and of itself is not going to have a positive or negative effect as a result of the decaffeination process. Does that answer your question? Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, if you wanted to either reduce or stop uh, consuming coffee and switch to decaf, um, what would be the best way of going about that? Um, and the answer to that is, would be it'd be much better to wean off. Um, that way, you're not uh, depriving your body of something that it's used to on a daily basis. And um, if you gradually kind of reduce that amount, uh, then it would be the more uh, successful way, I guess, of going about that. Do it gradually in order for that change to stick. Right? You don't want to become so frustrated. So the question, don't you repeat it? Okay. Um, I am actually unsure of this answer, Vanessa. Do you sure. know? So this is a question I get a lot, right? Are caffeinated drinks, I, I read that they're diuretics, so that means that they're dehydrating, right? Um, whenever you take in any sort of fluid, whether it's from a beverage or whether it's from food, remember that some foods do count towards your fluid intake, such as vegetables or clear liquids like soup or jello, um, you're still going to get a net hydration, okay? You may not be getting quite as much from a caffeinated beverage perhaps as you would from plain water or herbal tea, but it is still affecting your net hydration status, all right? So it still counts. You're not going to become dehydrated from drinking a regular, what we would consider or qualify as a regular amount of caffeine. So that is definitely a question that I do get a lot. So you're, you're safe with the coffee. Okay. The next question is, what's the advantage of lowering coffee intake if someone tries to lose weight? Does it affect the improved appetite and perhaps avoid the protein powder shake? I don't know its relation to that. Okay, so the question regarding cutting out caffeine with um, benefit toward weight loss. Um, if you are currently taking in your caffeine drinks accompanied with a lot of sugar and perhaps... Other All right, we have no, because caffeine is a drug um, and it is a stimulant um, and your body is as in a non-caffeinated state, if you were normally used to it, you're being, you're depriving your body of something that is used, very used to having and um, that can have adverse effects and cause headaches, um, nervousness, irritability. Yes, essentially. Um, caffeine supplements, no dose, et cetera, are those regulated by the FDA? They, they are regulated. Those substances are regulated by the FDA, yes. Yeah, they usually contain about the equivalent of a cup of coffee, but the label would be able to provide more information on that. I will say though too, so something like Nodos, um, those, those are more strictly regulated. Uh, however, things like weight loss supplements um, and other sorts of medications, those, I, well, I use the word medication very pointedly there because any type of supplement or vitamin should be treated, if you're using it as medicine, you should treat it as medicine, okay? Unfortunately, uh, there are not a lot of regulations that govern many supplements, so you may be unknowingly consuming more caffeine than you think.
So that is definitely something to be aware of. It's important to listen to your body if you start taking anything new. And if you do have a healthcare provider and you start taking a supplement regularly, please disclose that to your health provider so they're aware of what is going on regularly in your life. The, there's really no specific range that would affect sleep. Um, if we look at serving size, anything really under um, 30 or 40 is not really going to affect you um, in a way that uh, serving of like a cup of coffee or a full serving of tea or another kind of um, fuller caffeinated substance would. Um, so if you're having your coffee in the morning and um, nothing for the rest of the day, you're going to be able to go to sleep as normally just fine. 